Good afternoon. So we at UCLA acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of this land. And as a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. Welcome all from near and far. Welcome to students, including members of my two classes here today. And um, it's so wonderful that we see everyone like out in force. Um, this is our first in-person event for I think all of the units involved in uh, today's event. So thank you again for being here at one of the first, you know, in-person events after these two long years of isolation, worries, or grief for loved ones, or for a world that continues to bear new pain. But we're stepping out from all of that momentarily on this spring afternoon to celebrate the work of an incredible scholar and teacher. I want to thank the sponsors for this event. This would not have been at all possible without the tireless work by Nguyet Thom, the Assistant Director of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. Yay! Or the support by the Center for Near Eastern Studies, the Asian American Studies Center, the Asian American Studies Department, and the Critical Refugee Studies Collective. Please check out our websites for future ev events that bring exchanges of import to us. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce to you Professor Evan Lay Espiritu Gandhi, who teaches in our Asian American Studies Department. Her interdisciplinary research engages critical refugee studies settler colonial studies, and trans-Pacific studies. She's also working on a second book-length project, revisiting the Southern question, South Korea, South Vietnam, and the American South, which asks, how were South Korea, South Vietnam, and the American South connected during the Cold War period? What are the political, cultural, and affective afterlives of these historical encounters? Professor Gandhi is also a filmmaker, and you can check out her films on Vimeo. She also hosts a podcast called Distorted Footprints through her Critical Refugee Studies class. She's currently working on an exhibition in collaboration with the Guam Philharmonic to put together a museum exhibit entitled Saigon, The Experience a humanities-based exhibit that will include a brief history of the Vietnamese city of Saigon, a synopsis of Guam's particip participation during the Vietnam War, an explanation of Guam's role in processing Vietnamese refugees during Operation New Life, and a segment fe featuring a few Vietnamese refugees that relocated to the United States and other parts of the world. It will be framed in several parts told through text, motion pictures, images, soundscapes, artifacts, and public programming. The exhibit will run from mid-July to fall 2022 in Guam. This exhibition presents um, Professor Gandhi's research for her book in a different format. Now, we're here to celebrate and talk about the fresh off the press and pathbreaking book, Archipelago of Resettlements. Vietnamese refugee settlers and decolonization across Guam and Israel, Palestine. I'm turning to Professor Gandhi to give us a glimpse of her book. But first, I'd like to remind everyone that you could purchase copies at the table in the back after, what's the time? 5.30, yes. <laughs> um, and we will have time for book signing after the event. Um, and I was also told of a specific number of books that are available, so please um, don't lose out. <laughs> um, now, please help me welcome Professor Evan Lay Esperitu Gandhi. Thank you so much to Hung for that warm introduction. And thank you everyone so much to be, for being here. I'm so excited to see you and celebrate with you. So good afternoon. Uh, many thanks to uh, Link and all the cool organizers for making this event possible. Um, I'm really appreciative to my department in particular and my colleagues to Hung, Keith, and Lumna for your comments. And I'm so excited to hear what you think about the book. 
So um, I will be speaking today about the book, Archipelago of Resettlement, Vietnamese Refugee Settlers and Decolonization Across Guam and Israel-Palestine. Um, this book is also published open access, so you can download the book for free via the UC Press Luminous website, so I definitely encourage you to do that. Um, but we are selling books, and I will be signing them, <laughs> as Tu Hung mentioned. Um, but we're also doing a raffle, so if you didn't get your raffle ticket, um, make sure to get one, because we will be raffling off books as well. So I'd like to begin um, with a reading. So I'm going to read to you from the opening pages of the book. Um, and then I will take a step back and talk a little bit more about the case studies as well as the method for the book. So this is just a teaser. Um, and I hope that you read the rest as well. Vietnam is nước, water, country, homeland. Land and water, water is land. A duality without division, a contrast without contradiction. Nuk yik nam, a home, a cradle, a point of departure. One island in an archipelago of diasporic collectivity. According to Vietnamese mythology, yik nam was born out of the consummation of water and land. Oko, the mountain fairy, fell in love with Lak Mong Wan, the sea dragon king. Together they produced a hundred human children, Bak Yik. But Auka longed for the mountains and Lak Mong Wan longed for the sea, and so they separated, dividing their children across the lands and waters of Vietnam. Perhaps this originary division of a mother's children prefigured future cleavages. The division of North from South Vietnam along the 17th parallel in 1954, followed by two decades of civil war and US military intervention. And then the division of a unified Vietnam from its post-1975 refugee diaspora, who fled war's aftermath by air and by sea, who touched down on new lands and were washed in salt water. Vietnamese refugees resettled around the world, forging new islands of belonging in their respective countries of asylum. Collectively, these islands make up an archipelago of resettlement, a post-war diaspora connected by the fluid memory of a beloved homeland lost to war. As the Pacific Ocean links what Tongan writer Apeli Haofa famously termed a sea of islands, so too does Nuuk connect the archipelago a Vietnamese refugee resettlement. But resettlement is vexed when refugees resettle in settler colonial states. Resettlement is unsettling when predicated on the systematic dispossession of indigenous peoples. This book asks, what are the political implications of refugees claiming refuge on stolen land? Do archipelagos of refugee resettlement reinforce ongoing structures of settler colonialism? Or can they be refracted through Nuuk, a land-water dialectic, to call forth decolonial solidarities? These questions challenge us to think through distinct yet overlapping modalities of refugee and indigenous displacement, shaped by entangled histories of war, imperialism, settler colonialism, and US military violence. They invite us to imagine new forms of ethical relationality. Yêu nước, to love one's country, the highest virtue demanded of a Vietnamese. Mắc nước, to lose one's country, to be without the life source of water. Làm nước, to make water slash land, to quench the thirst of a parched heart. This book puts indigenous and settler colonial studies in conversation with critical refugee studies in order to theorize the refugee settler condition the vexed positionality of refugee subjects whose citizenship in a settler colonial state is predicated upon the unjust dispossession of an indigenous population. So I'm gonna skip ahead a bit and read you one more passage. Refugee settlers are not directly responsible for the settler colonial policies of the state into which they are both interpolated with an O and interpolated However, their processes of homemaking, of creating an island of belonging in their new country of resettlement, do take place on contested land, rendering them what Michael Rothberg calls implicated subjects. 
The challenge then is to put refugee critiques of the nation state in conversation with indigenous critiques of settler colonialism in order to challenge settler colonial states monopoly over the land and sea. Articulated together, refugee modalities of statelessness and indigenous epistemologies of human land water relations can unsettle settler colonial state violence, pointing us toward more pluralized forms of collective belonging routed through nuuk to lam nuuk then to make water slash land is to forge decolonial futurities. All right. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more um, about the case studies of the book, uh, which helped me elaborate this idea of the refugee settler condition. So the book focuses on two case studies to elaborate the refugee settler condition. I traced the migration of Vietnamese refugees to two sites of US military empire, as well as settler colonialism, namely Guam or Guahan and Israel, Palestine. So it's important to note that Guam, an unincorporated US ter territory since 1898, is part of a larger archipelago of Chamorro Islands, the Marianas. Palestine is less obviously an archipelago in the literal sense, but I draw from a map entitled The Archipelago of Eastern Palestine by Julian Buzak to help me think through how Israeli occupation and settler colonialism increasingly disrupt the contiguity of Palestinian sovereignty as well as life. And then as I mentioned, after the fall of Saigon in 1975, Hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese refugees fled Vietnam, displaced by communist aggression, as well as the US military's destruction of their homes and livelihoods in the wake of war. So Archipelago of Resettlement directs our attention to two overlooked but important sites of Vietnamese refugee resettlement. From April to November 1975, the US military processed over 112,000 Vietnamese refugees, on the unincorporated territory of Guam during what was called Operation New Life. And then from 1977 to 1979, the state of Israel granted asylum and citizenship to 366 non-Jewish Vietnamese refugees. So for Guam, we can ask, how do Vietnamese refugees relate to the ongoing tomorrow decolonization movement? For Israel-Palestine, the question becomes, how do Vietnamese refugees who are granted Israeli citizenship relate to the Palestinian liberation struggle. So analyzing these two case studies in relation illuminates two forms of critical geography. So first, thinking about archipelagos of empire. So examining how the Vietnam War is linked to US military buildup in Guam, as well as unwavering political and military support of the state of Israel. And second, thinking about corresponding archipelagos of trans-indigenous resistance. So tracing how tomorrow decolonization efforts and Palestinian liberation struggles are linked, and one way to think or visibilize those linkages is to trace the material passage of the Vietnamese refugee figure. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit about method. So this interdisciplinary project necessita necessitated multiple methodologies, archival research, oral histories, as well as literary and film analysis. So I conducted original archival research in the state of Israel, in Palestine, the continental US, and in Guam to better understand how the Zionist government in Israel, as well as the US military in Guam, represented Vietnamese refugees and talked about their resettlement efforts. I find that in Guam, the humanitarian rhetoric that newspapers and politicians used to describe Operation New Life actually retroactively justified settler militarism in Guam. And by extension, this positioned Vietnamese refugees in a structurally antagonistic relationship to Chamorro decolonization struggles that opposed and critiqued that very military settlement. In Israel-Palestine, Zionist leaders such as Prime Minister Menachem Begin drew parallels between Vietnamese refugees and Jewish refugees. And this discursive movement actually occluded the contemporaneous displacement of Palestinian refugees and exiles by Israeli settler colonial policies. Archival records, however, are largely told from the perspective of those in power. And therefore, I turn to oral histories with Vietnamese refugees in Guam and Israel-Palestine to better understand the lived experience of the refugee settler condition. And I find that largely given the trauma of forced displacement, many Vietnamese refugees express strong attachments to the lands of their resettlement, 
as well as sincere gratitude toward the settler institutions that resettlement. And in the book, I want to think about this and unpack this as a kind of refugee settler desire. So for the most part, they view indigenous decolonization movements with wariness or perhaps suspicion, expressing concern about further displacement under the uncertainties of what indigenous sovereignty would look like. So given these entrenched structural antagonisms that are kind of set up by what I'm calling the refugee settler condition, I therefore want to turn to cultural production from diasporic Vietnamese to Moro and Palestinian writers and artists to probe what Raymond Williams termed emergent structures of feeling. So thinking about these visions of decolonial solidarity, right, that have yet to be fully articulated in the social realm, but people are starting to imagine to sort of increase our political horizons and, and broaden them. So to conclude, I want to leave you with three quotes that also serve as the opening epigraphs to the book. The first, by Vietnamese refugee author Le Thi Dim Thuy, reads, quote, in Vietnamese, the word for water and the word for a nation, a country, and a homeland are one and the same. Nook. The second, by Palestinian poem, poet Mahmoud Darwish, says, quote, Beirut was a birthplace for thousands of Palestinians who knew no other cradle. Beirut was an island upon which Arab immigrants, dreaming of a new world, landed. And the last, by Chamorro poet Craig Santos Paris, intones, quote, Remember, home is not simply a house, a village, or island. Home is an archipelago of belonging. So thinking through the figure of the archipelago, as well as the Vietnamese concept of nuke, can point us towards decolonial epistemologies for forging refugee indigenous solidarities in the present. And I hope that this is part of the work um, that this book will do. So thank you very much. everyone. So um, we're the panel that um, is going to say a few things each to celebrate the book and, um, you know, raise uh, questions and hopefully we'll also have questions coming from you in the Q&A period. So I'm going to start the comments and then um, turn things over to Professor Keith Camacho and Professor um, Lubna uh, Kwatami. So critical refugee studies in recent decades has had to contend with fraught relationships between refugees and other communities who have been brutalized in their histories, co-opted or suppressed in militarized settler colonial states, opening the way for that difficult road from the location of Vietnamese refugees has been Professor Inle Esperitu, who is here with us today. Um, Amidst mainstream celebrations, <laughs> amidst mainstream celebrations of the life or academic achievements of Southeast Asian, particularly Vietnamese refugees, Professor Esperitu sounded the alarm a couple decades ago that such casting of refugees in these model and grateful roles went to shore up the reputation of and justification for the American empire after its defeat in the Vietnam War. As such, refugees could become complicit in projects of imperial militarism. Such critiques issue from this field of refugee studies continues with works of other scholars, many of whom are here with us here today. Professor Evan Gandhi's book takes that critique farther to explore how refugees become implicated in the settler colonial project across the Pacific and Palestine Israel, two sites of historical settler colonial br brutality that became places of refuge for Vietnamese refugees. As Vietnamese ref refugees, many of us knew about that kind of brutality. At a young age, I remember my father remarking with apprehension about the mid-1970s FBI suppression of the American Indian movement after wounded knee, the, the Wounded Knee occupation. I also remember feeling so distressed as I follow events in Palestine after I was introduced to 
introduced in the 1980s to its history by a professor who had converted to Islam. We were able to feel distress because such brutality was familiar to us from our own history of Vietnamese settler colonialism against people in Champa and Cambodia, including indigenous communities. It was also familiar to us because we were subjected to French colonialism. Each kind of colonialism came with its own brand of racism and brutality. But feeling affinity is one thing. Being acutely aware of our own complicity is something else altogether. Archipelago of Resettlement places Vietnamese refugees inescapably in the history of settler colonialism in places of our resettlement. Evan Gandhi does not place direct responsibility for, quote, the settler colonial policies of the state into which refugees are both interpolated and interpolated. However, their processes of homemaking, of creating an island of belonging in their new country of resettlement, do take place on contested land, rendering them what Michael Rothberg calls implicated subjects. Given this implication, we are faced with an epistemological dilemma that doubles as an ethical, political one. If we are to place refugees in these contexts and hold them accountable, how are we to do it? The question is a thorny one. How are we to talk about what Evan Gandhi theorizes as the refugee settlers if we do not rely on ways of knowing in indigenous studies and Palestinian studies in this case? Yet some folks have raised the possibility that refugees now in a position of, uh, to produce knowledge in institutionalized spaces like this university can practice a kind of extractive knowledge production from the very communities that have been oppressed in settler colonialism in the first place. In effect, we could be yet again even further implicated as refugee settlers. We feel the gravity of such questions, but what if we do not do this work? What are the costs of that? Might we dissolve that web of relationality, however fraught, however vexed, and withdraw into our respective corners of isolation and recrimination? Even if we refrain from engaging with one another for fear of reproducing the oppressive structures in our lives relative to one another, we cannot erase the ways of our paths have already been entangled. Evan Gandhi repeats how settler colonial violence provided the model of American soldiering in the Vietnam War, rendering Vietnamese killable by branding their land, quote, Indian territory, end quote or that American imperial objectives that pushed for American boots on the ground in Vietnam also went to support Israel's 1967 war during the same period. The stakes of both sets of questions could not be higher, and Evan Gandhi has risen to the challenge with thought and care. How we conduct this kind of scholarship has bearing on not just the econ academic, but also the solidarity work. She proposes that quote, articulated together refugee modalities of statelessness and indigenous epistemologies of human land water relations can unsettle settler colonial state violence, pointing us toward more pluralized forms of collective belonging rooted through new. She takes care not to reduce our conditions to one another's, conditions that at times subject refugees to just as much brutality as experienced by these other communities, and at other times place refugees in relative privilege. Using methods of, among other things, refugee interviews, archival research, a refugee memoir of repatriation, a Chamorro Vietnamese college blog, an Israeli documentary, and poetry by a Vietnamese Israeli writer and a Palestinian poet alongside one another, Evan Gandhi deployed critical juxtaposing, as Inle Esperitu calls it. In that way, Evan Gandhi places her insights and hopes in the ocean as medium and metaphor that divides yet connects separate histories and crisscrossing trajectories in an archipelago that will allow us to find our journeys out of places of danger or refuge. So that Chamorro decolonization efforts and Palestinian liberation struggles can also relate to refugee struggles. This month marks the end of one war in Vietnam. 
fought by force or by will for empire, nation, or survival between Americans and Southeast Asians amongst many combatants in the lands colonized or nationalized into Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. For Vietnamese, the months of March and April mark the, quote, internal flight by refugees from the central region of Vietnam from the military offensive named Dinh Diệt Ho Di Minh by Hanoi that swiftly unseated the Saigon government in the spring of 1975 after the American military withdrawal in 1973. That horrific death march made by those refugees along the central coast was followed by the refugee wave out of South Vietnam across the waters of so much history. Both Evan's family and many of our families here made our journey, some to American naval and air installations across the Pacific, Subic, Wahan, Wake, Hawaii, then to California. And we meet you here, peoples, caught up in brutal histories, in an archipelago of resettlement, but of also perhaps unsettlement. Thank you so much, and I'm gonna turn us um, over to, uh, thank you, to Professor Keith Camacho and Professor Lupna Kwatani. Thank you, Tu Hong. How are y'all doing? Good. It's hot, it's hot, but it's all good. You know why? Because you're cool. <laughs> so, you know, I just want to, I'm really grateful to be here and, and to thank Evan and all the, the supporters and Southeast Asian Studies Center and our, our sister units. And so uh, I just, I don't have prepared remarks. I have a couple of questions, but I had the privilege of witnessing uh, Evan take one, two, three ideas, uh, translate them into field research, translate them into particular texts to study and to write about and to translate them through her rhetoric training at Cal and then now here at UCLA. And you know, you read many a book, no matter your field, right? You could be in literature, you could be in history, you could be in political science. And there's only a few books that we think might have a kind of profound impact, kind of like what people might call canonical or, or emergent. There's not many books that do that. And so, you know, reading, uh, Evan's work in its initial draft form and now here to celebrate the book. You know, it's really a privilege. I'm, I'm so humbled to be in this conversation because, you know, Evan's really pushing the kind of methodological, intellectual, political boundaries, reshaping them and really uh, asking uh, questions anew. And, you know, growing up in Guam and the Mariana Islands, you know, I can name examples of Chamorro Palestinian intimacies or more Vietnamese intimacies, but also conflict and antagonisms at the local micro level, but never really had the kind of critical lens to, to think relationally and to think contextually about these things. And so, you know, taking stock of Evan's work, its trajectory, you know, um, and just everything, I'm just so grateful to be here and to celebrate really a path, path-breaking book. Uh, just remember us, Evan, when, you know, <laughs> Should you go somewhere else and, you know, I mean, we're on Rodeo Drive and you got your crew and you don't acknowledge it, that's fine. But, you know, I will, you know, I do have a couple of questions that, that are about your book, but they're also about, you know, this fraught thing called the university and, and, and um, post-colonial, even colonial knowledge production. And the first question that related, the first question is, like, you know, what um, analytics, ethics and or methodologies did you find most useful, most uh, productive, most relevant, but also not in the making of your monograph, in taking stock of all things Israel, Palestine, Guahan, Vietnam, right? And the second and related question is, you know, what advice do you have? Like, how do you sustain that, right? I mean, a lot of us come through area, tra area, area, tra area studies training you know, uh, whether it's the so-called East Asia, the so-called, you know, South Asia, the so-called Pacific, you know, like what advice do you have? How do you sustain that? How do you maintain these kinds of, as you put it, relational ethics, these kinds of uh, projects, right? So it's really, yeah, it's really a two-part question. Like one, how did you go about making this monograph and what are the uh, analytics, an an analytics, ethics, and our methods that prove useful or not? And then, you know, how do we move forward? And so that's really my question. I'm just here to celebrate and, and just be a part of this conversation and 
Um, just really humbled to learn from Evan and, and you all. Thank you. <laughs> Lubna is next. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I uh, thank you so much, everyone, for your comments, and um, Evan for opening up with such a beautiful illustration of what this book is about. Buy the book, get the signature at the end of this event. Um, I'd like to begin my remarks by extending gratitude and appreciation to Evan um, for this timely, necessary, and at times uncomfortable and challenging body of work. I regard the invitation to read Archipelago of Resettlement as a gift, where Gandhi clearly states her entrance into an inquiry with Palestine, being rooted in her own reflections on how to contribute to and partake in Palestinian liberation. For Palestine studies, this statement of intention is crucial, in part to pay respect to the invitation given by Palestinians to the global community to visit Palestine, engage in the liberation movement, and write about Palestine in relation to global struggles of, for decolonization. Gandhi has not taken that invitation for granted. Her book demonstrates the practice of reciprocity that is central to indigenous worldviews and relationships and is testament to the ethical maturity that an allyship necessary for reading and writing about a place and people experiencing the extant force of colonial captivity and dispossession. Those familiar with the challenges posited to the scholar of Palestine intimately know that there's a great deal of punishment, retaliation, censorship, and disciplining that takes place when Palestinian liberation is an animating feature of one's work. They also know how difficult it is to contribute to a field in which, in, in what has nearly always been an oversaturated terrain. There is indeed no shortage of works that engage the question of Palestine. In fact, there is a great body of literature on it, much of it extractive and pejorative. To secure their own comforts and privileges, many scholars have evaded or subordinated their scholarly responsibility toward Palestinian land, its stewards, and its dispossessed kin who have now been denied the right to return home for some 73 years. As Edward Said once potently noted in his 1985 text, After the Last Sky, Palestine is figuratively and literally a, quote, terribly crowded place, almost too crowded for what it, it is asked to bear by way of history or interpretation of history. Yet for all the writing about them, Palestinians remain virtually unknown. To think, read, and write Palestine while Palestine is under attack is a process that is accompanied by a great deal of risk. To think, read, and write Palestine when so much has been said about it already is a great responsibility. To think, read, and write Palestine through the lens of both indigeneity and refugeehood and in direct relation to the struggles of global refugee and indigenous peoples is a gift. Gandhi has profoundly shouldered these risks and responsibilities in this undertaking and in turn given us a gift that defies the colonial erasure of Palestine and global circulations of power. Among many noteworthy contributions of this text is the intellectual rigor that Gandhi demonstrates in constructing analytical and methodological tools that explode borders from within and without. Gandhi's proposal of the archipelago as a methodological and analytical tool simultaneously provincializes the power of the nation state, undoes the stasis of colonial and imperial geographies, posits contest to the violent force of border regimes and their regulated exclusions. It illuminates the artificial divisions of land and water that also represents ruptures between families and peoples and blurs the lines of rigid boundaries of academic disciplines and conventions of method. Bridging together indigenous and settler colonial studies with critical refugee studies and narrating Palestine and Guam through the figure of the Vietnamese resettled refugee attends to the decolonial practice of telling an otherwise story that follows the anti-colonial practice of tearing down structures that prohibit such connections. To resist temptations to capture Palestine, Vietnam, and Guam as fixed subjects and geographies of study is to resist the colonial legacies and borders that prohibit an understanding of how imperial cartographies are connected by empire. It is a political act of refusal that is necessary for de-isolating these lands and communities, reforging South-South solidarities, 
in efforts to make their enduring struggles for repatriation, return, and decolonization, decolonization certainly less lonely, but also co-constitutively realizable, even as they remain geographically discontinuous. For Palestine studies, this analytical and methodological maneuver is useful for studying Palestine and its global diaspora. It gives an out to what Rabbi Saleh has, a Palestinian scholar Rabbi Saleh defines as the not yet realized but already fully mutilated project of the nation state. Referring here to the 1993 Oslo Accords agreement that parceled Palestinian land into the archipelago of colonial, uh, colonial architecture that Palestinians are left to contend with while having had already been forced to surrender 78% of their historic lands to the Israeli state. In other words, as Palestinian scholar Sara Hamoud has suggested, Gandhi's analysis can help us challenge the territorialization of Palestine on just 22% of our historic lands and thus allows an examination of discontinuous Palestinian geographies and communities together, reversing the severances and fragmentations they have, we have endured as part of an ongoing Nakba or catastrophe. These communities and lands prominently include the historic lands of Palestine occupied in 1948, the lands occupied in 1967, namely the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and the Palestinian shatats, or that's the Arabic term for scattered, a scattered community, which refers to the Palestinian exilic community, who constitutes over 60% of the Palestinian nation, and we have been denied our right to return. Through her theorization of Nook as a continuity of water and land, and therefore a continuity between indigenous land-based struggles and refugee movements through water, Gandhi's work allows Chamorro, Palestinian, and Vietnamese theorizations to converse in the co-creation of a grounded proposal, a grounded proposal uh, uh, of pluralistic politics and practices for making decolonized futures. Herein lies the generative qualities that make an undertaking of what might otherwise be uncomfortable, an uncomfortable set of relations, the doubled up refugee settler position, for example, an important one to be exam examined through tackling the relationship between US imperialist wars and settler colonial conquest, Chamorros, Palestinians, and the Vietnamese figure centrally and co-constitutively into the US imperial imaginary. However, Gandhi's theorization of Nook invites the scholar of Palestine to embark on a more meaningful engagement with Chamorro decolonization efforts in Guam and an embrace of Palestinian Vietnamese relations be already the all, beyond the already established relationships figured by remnants of Cold War alliances and exchanges. Gandhi's book teaches us of the intimacies that forge across Guam, Palestine, and Vietnam, distinct sites or rather islands, colonized through US empire, but also of the people-to-people -people solidarities that have been forged or can be forged through what she defines as the archipelagic connect connections not only between Vietnam and Palestine, but also between the anti-imperialist and anti-colonial struggles in Cuba, Cambodia, Laos, South Africa, and Rhodesia. Archipelago Archipelagos is simultaneously a restoration of internationalism of the past and a grappling with the absences from the anti-colonial narratives of Cold War entanglements. However, Archipelagos of Resettlement is also a book that shines light on how refugee settler subjects are important actors of geopolitical critique. Another critical lesson that the book reveals is the parallel ways in which neoliberal benevolent humanitarianism has factored into settler colonial and imperial projects through refugee resettlement programs, whether by the US Operation New Life, which resettled Vietnamese refugees in Guam, or Israel's resettlement of Vietnamese refugees. Gandhi states, Israel, Israel's resettlement of 366 Vietnamese refugees during the late 1970s should be read as a performance of humanitarianism intended to recuperate Israel's image in the international sphere. This point is especially potent today, where both the US and Israel have widely and quickly opened the margins for refugee resettlement of Ukrainian refugees. Meanwhile, the US continues to restrict migration from the global south and the resettlement of Syrian and Afghan refugees in particular. And while Israel continues to deny Palestinian refugees, who constitute what the UN describes as the largest, oldest refugee population of the world, the right to return home. Borrowing from Gandhi and critical refugee studies scholar Yanli Spiritu, the analytical use of juxtaposition in this context 
reveals the ways in which humanitarianism that laces settler colonial refugee resettlement public relations discourses is par in part used to cover over their complicity in the creation of refugees and displaced people. While such a practice seems contradictory, Gandhi's work builds off the work of many other scholars, including Lisa Lowe, to reveal how liberalism and humanitarian, is, humanitarian rhetoric are not antithetical, but co-constitutive of teleologies of colonialism. Such considerations are crucial for Palestine studies to engage as Israel continues to promote humanitarian projects across the world, including Haiti, Puerto Rico, and refugee resettlement agendas for Syrian refugees, such as through the global coalition, like the multi-faith coalition. This kind of work is particularly useful as we continue to think of an ethnic studies approach that considers land, water, and people as contiguous. Centering indigenous and refugee theorizations together is a pow powerful act of subversion, but also when looking closely at these entangled histories, the only way to consider a political alter alterity that we need. Gandhi proposes that refugee too offers important insights into decolonization because Nook and transit quote, nook and transit are not in opposition to Vietnamese refugee resettlement, but rather inherent to it. As she powerfully concludes, nook and island bridges land and water, like the present, it connects past and future. Only by engaging refugee past and working through the refugee settler condition in the present can we begin to theorize refugee futurities and decolonial horizons. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to open up the floor for questions and answers, and Professor um, uh, uh, Victor Basquera will uh, moderate the Q&A session. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's my uh, pleasure to be Phil Donahue, I guess, type of role. Um, and I also invite the panelists if they have questions. And I know that Professor Camacho had posted um, pose some questions to uh, Professor Gandhi if um, that might be a way to get started too. Um. Sure, I can start us off um, while y'all are thinking. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you so much uh, to Hung and Keith and Lubna for your comments, for your engagement, <clears throat> for your generosity. Um, you know, I think that writing a writing and the writing process can in some ways be a lonely process. And so I just appreciate this ability to um, engage and be in conversation, you know, with the project. And I, I just appreciate, yeah, you know, so you celebrating with me. Um, and it, it's so great to hear, you know, what parts I think resonate with, with different folks and, and different communities. So I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'll just respond and then also answer Keith's tough questions. <laughs> um, Oh, there's a bee on me. <laughs> so, uh, to Hung, you know, I just kind of want to appreciate your comments and maybe highlight a, a couple things. You know, I appreciate you um, drawing our attention, right, to Black April, um, what this what this month means for Vietnamese refugee communities, um, while also kind of attending to um, the risks of this project, to thinking, you know, and calling out the Vietnamese state as a settler colonial state as well, um, and thinking about how that leads to um, these entangled histories that I'm trying to work through. Um, and Lumna, you know, I also appreciate you um, drawing attention to um, kind of, I guess, the urgency, right, of this conversation, thinking about ongoing sort of refugee um, movements and forced, uh, forced movements, um, but also this like ongoing question of um, return, right, and the right of return that we need to attend to. Um, and I've learned, you know, so much from you, but sort of Palestinian feminism more broadly, right, to sort of think through um, how decolonial movements can also be critiques of nation state movements, right, that we don't need to, um, that the decolonial vision doesn't need to be state sovereignty in that way, right? Um, so thinking um, through uh, a lot of work that's been doing, a lot of activism that's been doing in that space as well. Um, so, Keith, thank you for the invitation to sort of talk about, you know, methods, um, thinking about relational ethics. Um, maybe I'll start by saying, you know, I started uh, this project um, looking for models of decolonization and solidarity and refugee um, sort of indigenous solidarity, you know, I think to um, one as a response to kind of what was happening in Gaza in 2014 in particular um, when I was sort of starting to write this project. Um, and, 
I think one sort of methodological difficulty that I encountered was that it was, there's actually not quite a lot of examples yet. And so I think part of the project began was to kind of just back up and try to articulate and really unpack um, without sort of pointing fingers or blaming, you know, sort of our refugee communities and our um, so the fraught histories that they carry with them, um, why this solidarity is so hard, right? And thinking about these larger geopolitical um, and historical contexts and movements that brought these people into relation um, and try to set up a kind of structurally antagonistic relation, but how can we think beyond that, right? Um, and I think that it was actually uh, quite hard for me initially to write alongside a lot of the oral history interviews that I had done. So I think, you know, when you ask Keith about training, you know, what training what was useful. So I was uh, did my PhD in the rhetoric department at uh, UC Berkeley, and I think I was trained in a kind of discursive critique, right? So it was actually easy for me to critique the Zionist state's rhetoric or the US military's rhetoric. But I realized that you can't have that same kind of um, reading practice um, when you are engaging with these stories that people are telling you, right? Um, and even as I want to push our communities to think about decolonial solidarities that are really hard to articulate, um, I also want to take seriously you know, the histories and the fraught histories that they are sharing with me. So it, I think it encouraged me that you can't come at every sort of reading praxis with this kind of reading praxis of critique, right? which I was kind of trained in. So that, I think, was something that I had to learn. Um, and I think that a lot of it has been trying to just read broadly, um, listen broadly to different communities, um, and connect broadly, you know, both sort of outside of academia and inside academia, thinking about different activist spaces in different fields, right, as one way to kind of do this project. Um, it is hard, you know, to, I think, sort of speak outside of one's community and one's field, um, but I think that, as Tuhung said, you know, it, that risk is worth taking, <laughs> I hope. Um, but I think that, you know, in trying to think of a language to bring these sites together um, and these different time periods together, um, one thing that was important for me is, was not to come up with some sort of analytic that I impose, right? But for, you know, really thinking about the archipelago and Nook as something that is coming out of these communities and these histories, right? It's not just this fancy academic metaphor that I want to impose, but really trying to learn from um, Palestinian understandings and relationships to the sea, you know, sort of Tamara understandings of land and water and the island and the archipelago, um, as well as Vietnamese understandings of Nook as one way to inform um, my own, I guess, sort of, yeah, analytical um, relationship to these texts and, and these movements. So. Any questions? I hope that gave you enough time to <laughs> think of your questions. Great, thanks, Professor Gandhi. Excellent, very helpful, very uh, um, committed. Uh, yes. Hello. Oh. Um, so I want to say congratulations to releasing the book. Um, I read the book a little bit, um, and especially the A Terms to Know pages, I think. and. Um, I'm not sure if it was um, referenced in the pages of terms, but um, I know that I know that you ref use we uh, in the book you use um, uh, what is it like um, the day that uh, Saigon fell, and so you know I was like thinking you know um, did you ever like um, the thought occur to you when um, to to explain why you use that term instead of like let's say you know re reunification day. Awesome, that's a great question. So thinking about April 30th, right, as um, the, the term fall of Saigon, as you mentioned, is very politicized, right? So it is coming from um, an anti-communist perspective, a refugee perspective, um, and thinking about, I guess, like the politics of all the terms, right? So also the sort of decision um, to write Israel-Palestine rather than uh, Palestine, right? Um, as well as kind of different um, spellings of, of tomorrow, which we have talked about as well. But maybe to answer your question, um, you know, I think one of the things that was um, a challenge for this project was to think about the different political iterations um, of Vietnam and what Vietnam signifies to different people, um, as well as in different time periods, right? So 
um, chapter one of the book, um, as Lubna alluded to, really tries to think about Vietnam-Palestine solidarities um, that were happening in this 60s, 70s moment before the movement of Vietnamese refugees um, to Israel-Palestine, and then they became Israeli citizens, right? But one thing to note is that that connection, right, or that kind of Cold War moment and Third World Solidarity movement, those expressions of solidarity were coming from um, the sort of northern Vietnamese um, or sort of communist decolonial movement, right? And so acknowledging that there were different visions of what a sort of post-colonial decolonial state looked like, um, in which, and, and in that vision, to, to think about April 30 is to think about the reunification, right, and the actually independence, post-colonial independence, finally, um, for, for Vietnam. Um, but I think that I also wanted to say that even as we need to acknowledge these different um, political divisions um, within Vietnam, they were also relatively short-lived, and they were also kind of colonially and imperially imposed, right, this kind of division between North and South Vietnam. And so I'm hoping that, you know, people are able to kind of um, trace, I guess, the different contiguities between these different sort of Vietnamese political um, iterations of what Vietnam means. Um, but I think that because for most of the book, I wanted to attend to refugee communities as part of, I think, kind of respecting their um, language and understanding of that day. But that's a great question. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, yes. Hi, um, thank you so much for speaking. I thought that your book was really insightful and that the ideas portrayed in your book, especially pertaining to like settler decolonialism, was also really insightful to me. Um, I was actually curious about what you said at first concerning like the mythology or the linguistics of like nook or the idea that water also means homeland um, and how you interwove that and interconnected that with other ideas of like settler, settler decolonialism. Um, are there any, uh, is there any other evidence in like mythology or linguistics that sort of portray like, like a connection between settler, settler decolonialism and Vietnam? That's a good question. To whom do you want to take the little, this language question? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe I'll just kind of start by talking through what how Nook was helpful for me. Um, I don't know if I have um, other examples off of the top of my head, but I will defer um, to Hung if she wants to sort of chime in. But you know, I think for me, um, Nook is something that is really important as well for the diaspora, right? As a way to sort of think about our continual connection um, to a homeland lost to war, um, as well as for the sort of second generation or the post-memory generation, which is my generation, right? As someone who is actually um, born in Turtle Island. Um, and so for me, you know, again, trying to think through, you know, what is a kind of, um, new language that we can think about to articulate um, these decolonial solidarities that seem so hard to articulate in the present. But when I say new, you know, they're actually quite old, meaning that they are sort of coming. They, these are sort of epistemologies that are um, coming from the community itself, right? And I think it's more kind of um, trying to reframe um, I guess, you know, what these, these terms um, can mean, you know, more expansively. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can um, add a whole lot to that. I think there's also like the older usages of new that means not just like homeland in terms of a sense of belonging and memory, that um, because we are part of the refugee community, we're much more attuned to that um, understanding of the word nu as homeland. But nu um, can also mean something else that is much more closely connected to Vietnamese settler colonialism, which is the phrase um, um, yung nu and yung nu, right? Um, where you set up a, um, a, a nation, a state, or a government actually to control the water resources 
in Southeast Asia, and whoever controls the water resources controls the population and the land. So there's, it, it, there's also that usage that is much more closely connected to power and a kind of centralization of power, authoritarian um, kind of power that is very exclusive. And it was used in Vietnam to denote this, the Vietnamese settler colonial expansion to the South. Um, against the people of Champa and then against the people of Cambodia. Um, so it has those other dimensions, which actually goes to, um, to I think, highlight the ways in which um, Evan thinks about the duality um, of nuke, right? So nuke isn't just something that is positive. Um, it also divides um, in this sort of like uh, archipelago kind of um, framing of the issue. Um, so yeah, so nuke can like be, you know, there are different sides to how you might want to interpret um, nuke, you know, in, in terms of the history of its usage um, in Vietnamese history. Hello, thank you so much for the talk and I'm really looking forward to reading the book. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your experience in the archives and if you found anything that surprised you or kind of shocked you or was it things that you expected? Um, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so yeah, so I think my experience in the archives was very different, right, for different spaces, um, because I think that they are so um, entangled with the state and state power, right? Um, so for, um, in Palestine, uh, I actually went to um, the West Bank, um, and there they had um, these rich uh, anthologies that I draw a lot from, sort of in my, and for, for this book. Um, and these were anthologies were called, um, Basically, international documents or documents of inter Palestine's international relations, basically, right? Um, which was a very kind of resistant and profound and um, sort of uh, political project, right? Which is to say that Palestine is an independent um, state that does have independent relations with all of these other countries and movements um, and sort of political um, visions. Um, and so I had come initially because one of my interviewees had said, oh, there's this great speech um, of Ho Chi Minh basically expressing solidarity um, with the Palestinian uh, movement um, in the, I want to say from 1969. Um, and then I came to the archive and realized that actually there are so many <laughs> examples, uh, much more than I had expected of these kind of like Vietnam-Palestine relations. Um, so just kind of tracking that over the 60s, 70s moment through these sort of collated documents um, I think was really powerful. Um, in the state of Israel, um, so Israel is very, um, has a lot of control <laughs> over, you know, it's sort of, um, of Im its image uh, as well of its um, sort of uh, documents associated with the sort of state building project. Um, and so actually you, uh, as I, as a, a researcher, was not allowed into the archive. So there is already a very kind of explicit um, editorial process that happens. You have to speak to uh, an archivist and you tell them what you're interested in um, researching and they give you what they would like to give you, basically. Um, so already there, you can kind of see the power dynamics at play. You know, I think that in some ways, um, one of the uh, potential benefits to the research process is that, um, you know, as Lumna talked about, Israel is actually quite proud <laughs> of its Vietnamese refu re refugee resettlement um, history because it can reframe it as this sort of humanitarian gesture, right, that occludes and directs attention away from ongoing settler colonial policies. So they actually were quite um, open, I think, in giving me a lot of these. Um, sort of private telegrams, for example, in which um, these Israeli uh, ambassadors were quite explicit that they had um, certain um, desires or expectations of which refugees from Southeast Asia they wanted to bring in and which ones were considered um, sort of uh, threatening um, or outside of the kind of national body, body politics. So along kind of questions of race and gender and sexuality, we can kind of see these being reproduced. 
Um, and then again, you know, at the University of Guam, I was mostly at the Micronesian Area Research Center, uh, which was such a wonderful <laughs> experience, to be honest. So, you know, I was doing a lot of research on Operation New Life, and they had already had kind of boxes um, put together of a lot of newspaper clippings. And one really interesting thing that I found um, was actually a high school newspaper um, that, and, and in this kind of a high school newspaper, a high school student, um, a Chamorro student, had written about her experience visiting the Vietnamese refugee camps um, and her initial kind of um, concern of like, oh, there's all these foreign people here. But actually, towards the end of the article, we can see this very interesting narrative arc where she then builds a kind of interpersonal, um, sort of more one-on-one -on -one, um, engagement with um, these uh, Vietnamese refugee um, youth that she also meets at this concert, right? Um, and that, I think, was such a beautiful um, gift, you know, of, of the archive to have this firsthand account um, and to have someone so, you know, so generously and, and openly sort of talk about that fraught encounter, right, and, and what it could mean. Great. Very good question. Um, oh, yes, over here. Um, so first, hi, Evan. Congratulations on this uh, book launch. Um, it's really great to be here to celebrate um, this book. Um, I've just started reading it, but I think one concept that I found really helpful for me was um, what you talk about in terms of transience and permanence in uh, Guam. I was wondering if you could walk us through kind of how you think about uh, you know transience, permanence, and uh, mil settler militarism, and how that might connect to you know other transits in, uh, across Guam, whether that's militarized, tourism, and anything else. So. Thank you, Jason, uh, for that question. Um, so for this, this is for chapter five. I'm really interested in thinking about um, what I call a sort of transient permanent um, dynamic of settler militarism as it um, manifests in Guahan. So part of this was the question of how do we think about decolonization, but also Vietnamese refugee um, settlers um, complicity and responsibility to ongoing settler militarism when actually a lot of them had left and did not stay in Guahan, right? So one um, argument could be that, oh, well, actually they have vacated Tomorrowland and therefore they are no longer responsible for um, the ongoing um, sort of military occupation, right, of the island. Um, because of the 112,000 refugees that were initially processed in that 1975 period, um, only several thousand ended up staying, and then now the population is much smaller, probably closer to the hundreds in terms of people who are still there um, from 75. Um, and so this, you know, kind of led me to a lot of um, other work that uh, Chamorro and other historians of Guam had done to think about actually this larger pattern, right, of seeing Guam as this kind of stopover space, right, um, in which there was also this circulation of military settlers who were not um, articulating a kind of permanent uh, relationship to this the to Guam in terms of kind of private property ownership that we see, for example, here. Um, in California, um, as well as we see, you know, in spaces such as um, in the state of Israel, right, when it's so much of it is about reclaiming reclaim on a sort of personal sort of capitalist, you know, this is my property kind of articulation. Um, so what happens when you actually have people like transiting in and out very quickly? That actually, I think, occluded what, so that kind of transience occluded what was then much more permanent of a structure of the military as an institution um, constantly kind of building up their um, power um, on, on the island of Guahan. Um, so trying to think then about Vietnamese refugees um, counterintuitively that it's actually the ones I think who stayed um, and who are more intimately therefore um, accountable to and responsible to and sort of on an interpersonal level have to engage with every day these kind of ongoing conversations um, about tomorrow decolonization that are happening on the island um, and thinking about, you know, even for those um, of us or those families who have left, you know, there is this still kind of responsibility to think about um, the U.S. military's role um, in Guam. Great, thank you. Um,
We're doing pretty well on time. I think we've got time for maybe two, maybe three more questions. I actually think there was a hand over here. Yes. Hello. Congratulations on the book release. Um, I wanted to ask, were there any maybe overt or even covert challenges to what you were writing that really stood out to you? From like interviewees or from, uh, from other interlocutors, from academics? Uh, maybe from academics and interviewees. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did people hate me? Uh, um, I think that there was a challenge. Well, OK, so I, I, maybe I wouldn't say, um, how should I answer this question? Well, you know, I think as, as uh, Lubna, you know, um, sort of outlined for us, you know, whenever folks talk about Palestine or when people call um, the state of Israel a Zionist state or a settler colonial state, there's always that sort of question, right? Um, and the challenge to that um, assertion. So I think that, you know, um, as anyone who sort of works or, or writes or expresses solidarity with Palestine, there's always that pushback. Um, and uh, maybe I'll, I guess I'll just share kind of a story of doing research um, in uh, Israel-Palestine, which is a very kind of like fraught and racializing space. You know, um, most of the time I uh, was read as an American. Um, I'm not read as Arab or Muslim or Palestinian, so that I think gives me a certain kind of pass um, of not being the explicit kind of target of political suppression. But interestingly, you know, what I'm one of the things uh, think, think about the sort of like racial logics and um, Israel Palestine is that most Asians are are um, actually temporary foreign workers, right? So they are um, not Israeli citizens, um, and demographically, that that is most of the Asian people of Asian descent that you'll encounter, for example, in Tel Aviv. So this kind of leads to, um, you know, I think in Asian American studies and thinking about Asian immigrants to the US, we always kind of talk about a perpetual foreigner stereotype um, and thinking about how that is articulated um, differently, but also quite intensely um, in this sort of Israel-Palestine state. If you're read as Asian, you're assumed to be someone who has no pathway to citizenship just because that's how the laws work. Um, but it was also interesting for me to be misread a couple times as also a sort of Asian foreign worker. Um, so I remember being harassed on the street. You know, someone came up and said, I, I'll give you a cell phone. Like, can you come work in my house <laughs> and be my domestic? Um, and, and just trying to kind of navigate that, I think, and thinking about, you know, I as someone who has, um, you know, the privilege to leave this space. You know, how do my interlocutors or these Vietnamese Israelis have to encounter that kind of misrecognition um, and harassment on a day-to-day -day basis? Great, thank you. Um, and then there was a hand over here. Yes. Hello, thank you for such a beautiful and capacious book. Um, something that really struck me was the amount of translation in the work, whether it be like that really specific scene in the documentary, or is it like, is it settler or is it immigrant, right? And the political stakes of that. <laughs> but I also think that you write about translation and its slipperiness and the, like the inability to grasp that as like also crucial to decolonial solidarity and decolonial futurity. So I was wondering if you could speak more about, yeah, like translation and knowing and, you know, that misrecognition and how that might be central to, you know, different types of relationships. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so maybe I'll talk about translation um, just kind of in relation to method as a response to this, um, but also I think the kind of political um, promise. I guess, of translation, um, and I think what I'm kind of trying to do with this. So, you know, I think one, um, we Keith kind of alluded to this, and we've talked, you know, had conversations about um, kind of like the area studies model, right? Um, and part of um, that sort of area studies model or training um, is to kind of encourage a lot of sort of a deep dive, right, into one particular space or one particular language, um, culture, et cetera. And I think you know part of one of the um, 
risks, but also challenges and promises of doing a project like this is that it is a, in some ways, you know, it's a quote unquote single authored book, but it is a very collaborative project, right? So you have a lot, you know, as someone who um, is not fluent, for example, in Arabic and, you know, is uh, studied some Hebrew, but is not fluent in Hebrew, for example. So there's also the kind of logistical question of language. Um, so think, you know, for me also being very, open to working with translators. Um, so for example, the um, Vietnamese Israeli poet, <coughs> excuse me, Van Wing, who I write a lot about, um, her work is uh, originally published in Hebrew um, and she speaks English, so we would communicate you know, in, in primarily English and in some Vietnamese, um, but she herself you know, didn't do the English translations. And when I first encountered her work um, as a graduate student, it had not been translated yet. Um, and so I think for, you know, kind of on a sort of practical and sort of methodological level, it was also building up a relationship with the translator, right? Um, to uh, have early access to some of the translations that she was working on, but also to kind of be able to have insight on that kind of what is this process like of translating from the original Hebrew to English, right? Um, and kind of, I think, being open to that, um, I guess, kind of like vulnerability of you, you know, and, and kind of the, uh, the part of the collaboration is having that sort of be outside of your control, but it's also relationship building. So I think that translation, I guess, also on the political promise part of it, right, um, is to think about how can we think about the points of intersection between these different um, communities and epistemologies and political visions right across Vietnamese, Chamorro, um, Palestinian, et cetera, um, while also not uh, trying to conflate them, right? Um, so I think that uh, sort of Guy Tree's feedback on sort of translation as a site of catechesis is really helpful for me for thinking through that, right? So to think about, you know, what is lost in translation and, and thinking about all these risks of doing this kind of project, but also, you know, even if it's hard, <laughs> you know, there's still, um, I guess, uh, worth in trying to do that kind of really tough translational work uh, while sort of respecting the uh, respective differences, I guess, yeah. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, one more question. Um, yes, sorry. Hello, oh wow. <laughs> my name is Veronica Navarrete, and um, I wanted to ask, what did you learn about yourself or your community during this research that you didn't know before entering? That's a great question, I appreciate that question. Um, so I write a little bit about in the introduction, um, but uh, my family does have um, community ties to Guahan, so they were, uh, my mom and grandmother were processed um, in Guam as part of this Operation New Life. Um, so I think that on a sort of personal history level, it was really um, wonderful, you know, uh, in, in a lot of ways to be able to have the time and space to go in the archive and kind of build up a filler picture of um, what happened during that Operation New Life time, um, as well as really um, read about and hear about the role that the Chamorro population, you know, played in that resettlement process. You know, usually if you if people recognize Operation New Life at all, it is told as a as a narrative of the U.S. military helping Vietnamese refugees, um, and so I think it was. Um, a really great learning experience to know about all of these um, other uh, key players, right? Um, and how a lot of um, these folks, for example, the governor, um, Governor Bordalio at the time, um, who is Chamorro and was a big proponent of Chamorro rights, you know, thinking about how he was articulating um, his welcome of Vietnamese refugees, right? Um, that was something that I learned. I think also, you know, I. Um, it, it's also helped me, I think, sort of articulate and reflect on uh, my sort of positionality um, and role um, also, I guess, as a refugee settler, you know, in this space and Tavangar, which we are in now. Um, and so I think it's made me really um, self-reflective of what are the kind of political 
um, visions that we can think about, but also kind of responsibility um, and accountability in my role as a, a teacher, you know, also a writer, um, and someone who wants to kind of um, give folks, I think, a language to, to think through these um, sort of structural antagonisms that can become solidarity. So yeah, thanks for the question. Great, thanks everyone. Um, and if you wanted to...